Safe World. Nice to meet you all. So, David Rowan, editor of Wired magazine, which is a magazine about the people, the innovators changing the world, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Steve Jobs. Um, so I kind of have to live in the future and to spot the trends that are coming mainstream pretty quickly because everything is up for grabs now. Technology is evolving so quickly and consumer and business strategies have to keep up. Um, so I've been asked to look into the future to work out where the world is going and what we need to do about it. So luckily, I'm a bit of a collector of predictions of the future from the past and you can learn an awful lot from them. So there's one video I'm going to show you now, which is from 1967, about how the world will look way ahead in 1999. Fingertip shopping will be one of the many homemaker's conveniences. This video console will be channeled into the store of her choice. There, a camera will scan a display of wares, which she will select by push button. Another part of this console is a household monitor screen which maintains a watch on critical areas in the house, swimming pool or yard. What the wife selects on her console will be paid for by the husband at his counterpart console. All bills and transactions will be carried out electronically. A central bank computer will debit the family's account the amount of purchases and credit the department store, for example, informing the family's home computer at the same time. Father, at the touch of a button, receives an instantaneous printed copy of his budget, the amount of taxes he owes, the payments left on the car, and so forth. All documents and household records are available on the video screen for immediate reference. Also at his disposal is an electronic correspondence machine, or home post office, which allows for instant written communication between individuals anywhere in the world. To maintain these and hundreds of complex electronic circuits, a monitor checks all circuits every few seconds, inserts a backup circuit if and when trouble develops, and alerts the communal service agency for replacement. ever heard of this thing called the cloud that is what the cloud looks like so what I love about this film 44 years old but it got it completely right it's this it's the smartphone this is the device that is your electronic correspondence machine this is the device used to make your purchases to look at the videos of your kids so I just like to say forget technology it's not about the device that comes along. It's about our human needs. And we will use whatever makes it easier to access those needs, to express ourselves socially, to connect with our friends, to simplify our lives, to go about our daily tasks in an easier, simpler way. There's no magic. So I live by the maxim um, that the science, fighter, fight, science fiction writer William Gibson said, um, he's the guy who coined the idea of cyberspace, that you know, the future's here now. It's just unevenly distributed. So through Wired, we try and look at the outliers, the people who are doing the things that are going to catch on because they respond to our human, our emotional needs. And they are going to go mainstream quicker than people predict. Um, and it's a time of disruption. It's a time where all the rules have been torn up. Nobody knows. So three years ago, I launched a magazine, a print magazine, so I had this skill set, which was about you know, cropping pictures and commissioning words and working out what cover lines were going to be. Um, and that's not what I do now. It's changed. So we have an iPad edition. That means I have to learn about how to make film, how to do audio, how to do interactive experiences. We do a podcast, so we're now radio broadcasters. Um, tomorrow we're doing our first two-day quite ambitious conference in London. So we're not a magazine, we're a brand around a community and people want to experience our brand in different ways. Um, some of our 
sister magazines at Condé Nast are doing other quite interesting things. If you go to Moscow, you can have lunch with the models in the Vogue Cafe and the oligarchs. Um, and in the evening, you can go to the GQ bar. So, you know, if you think this is a publishing business, it's not. And this is going to happen to every business. Your guaranteed revenue streams are changing. You just have to keep innovating and experimenting and responding. Although, sometimes you are going to fail. So in the publishing world, a couple of years ago, Cosmopolitan decided to be a yogurt brand. I don't think that was the answer. Um, I don't know if you remember in The Graduate, that scene where um, Mr. Maguire says to Benjamin, Benjamin, I just want to say one word to you. One word. So if it were being made today, um, it wouldn't be plastics that was the key to Benjamin's success and wealth. It would be this word. Because everything is going mobile. The whole internet is now mobile. And you've got to realize it now because the accelerating pace of the mobile rollout is just extraordinary. I'll give you a couple of examples about why we're no longer in the era of the desktop, but the mobile device. Um, numbers. So the desktop internet era you know, is pretty powerful, but it's still reached only a third of the number of people on mobile devices who are quite quickly upgrading to the smartphone, these devices that have more computing power than the first NASA rockets. And just look at the number of devices out there already. So if you think about you know, the mainframe computer era in the 60s, there were maybe a million of these big machines that took up a whole room. And by the PC era in the 90s, maybe you know, 100 million. That's pretty significant. It made Bill Gates some money. So the desktop internet, you get to a billion, but already 10 billion plus mobile devices, and that's not just smartphones and tablets, it's gaming systems, it's your connected car, it's everything. It's your wireless home appliances, it will be the sensors that attach to your skin that track your bodily metrics to ensure you're healthy. And this is just the start. So the, all this data is flowing into the network. So there's quite a good opportunity if you can tap into that data. So we reached a critical point earlier this year where officially we entered the mobile internet age. Um, and you can say that because the number of smartphones and tablet devices overtook the number of PCs for the first time in the first quarter of this year. And that was way, way before the analysts said it was going to happen. So something profound is happening in consumer behavior. So if you don't want to, it's only 11 o'clock, you don't want to take in all those data points. This is the trend. And this is where it leads. And I think it's no accident that this, no, this is no longer the richest man in the world. He's been overtaken by this man, who's Carlos Slim, who made his fortune initially through telecoms. So we're talking about data. Um, we're putting out extraordinary amounts, which creates opportunities if you can turn that data into actionable information. Um, so Eric Schmidt, the outgoing CEO at Google, um, said a couple of months ago that in the whole of human civilization, collectively, as a species, we generated about five exabytes of data, five billion gigabytes of data, up to 2003. But now, we're producing that much every two days and the pace is accelerating. So, you know, this is every API connecting to an app, every YouTube video you're watching, every voicemail, every text message. You know, and his company's mission is to control and order and create access to all that data. And it's affecting, you know, in my life, just how my behavior has changed because of this. So, I bought on Amazon one terabyte of storage, 50 pound. I thought, I'm never going to fill one terabyte of storage. You can do a lot with one terabyte. Um, my music taste is a bit more diverse than that, but you get the point. I filled it within about three or four weeks, because you stop deleting things. You watch a movie, you store it for possible future use. You back up relentless 
collections of voicemails and everything. Um, because the storage costs are now moving to zero. So what happens in a world where everything can be stored at no cost? We're just going to go into default mode of generating and collecting data. And it's mostly just sitting there. So you've got to find ways to use it. It's data about where you are at that moment, what your social graph is doing, what your personal preferences are. We're telling the world. So I'll talk a bit about how this provides huge opportunities. But you know, here in the UK, we're just on 3G. This is Yota, a Russian company that's rolling out 4G around the world. This is their little egg that provides 4G. So again, think of how behavior changes where you expect, sitting on the bus, the 4G high definition video, the not instant messaging, not texting, but the real high quality video conversations with anybody you want to connect with. The amount of data we're giving out that actually can help us understand our own personal futures. So there's a company in California called 23andMe that if you spit into this little tube they'll send you, it's a couple of hundred pounds, five weeks later you get your personal web page with detailed breakdown of your genes, your DNA. Um, 23 because 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human. Um, so I did this. I'm curious. I wouldn't be telling you if I discovered something that my insurance company would like to know about. But it's fascinating. You get you know, pages of your risk factor for 50 odd illnesses. It tells you what your options are for, you know, are you likely to go bald? What color are your eyes? It tells you your reaction to various medications. Do you have a flush reaction to alcohol? And then it tells you where your family originated geographically. So I'm proud to say I can trace some of my family's origin back to Warren Buffett and his family, although we didn't have his good fortune, unfortunately. The other thing that happens, though, is it tells you who in their database is your cousin. So it gives you lists. I've got 900 cousins on their database. Um, and it breaks it down into second cousins, third cousins, and fourth cousins. And you start getting your emails in your 23andMe inbox, such as this one I got from Alison. Hello, my name's Alison. I'm contacting you because we share 0.62% of our DNA on six segments, and we could be distant cousins. Do you want to chat? So this is serious. This is people who I don't know who are contacting me for a chat because genetically we're related. Um, and I kind of figured, you know, sorry, Alison, I've still got all these LinkedIn requests, these Facebook friend requests, these unanswered spam emails. I'm not going to do the 23andMe social network. But you see where this is going. And then if, let's take health again. If you have data and you know where people are, how can you turn it into information that improves their life, that modifies behavior. So um, asthma, I'll show you an example of what is happening. Anybody here have asthma? OK, so you'll know that one of the problems is you can't always predict where and when it's going to occur. There's often environmental pollutants that trigger things off. And a bunch of American doctors thought, well, what if we can get lots of people who are using inhalers and connect a little GPS sensor inside the inhalers that tells a Google map where in the city they're inhaling. That could give us a real-time map of where asthmatics should avoid. So they created a quite clever little setup called Asthmapolis. Each day, millions of Americans carry and use inhalers to relieve asthma symptoms. How often a person uses their inhaler indicates how well their disease is managed. The Spiroscout is a small device that attaches easily to most inhalers. It uses GPS to automatically determine the exact time and location when the inhaler is used, because revealing where people use their inhalers provides valuable clues about environmental exposures that cause attacks. Our tools help patients, physicians, and public health agencies systematically track asthma in real time so that they can put the latest information to work to better understand and control the disease. So we're just at the beginning of this transformative era of innovation using all this data, using geolocation, using sensors. Um, 
there's a group at MIT at the Sensible Cities Lab who have created a bicycle wheel. They launched at the Copenhagen Climate Conference. They call it the Copenhagen wheel that's got all sorts of sensors in. And if a bunch of people are using that wheel around the city, it creates a mesh network, which again tells real-time maps, you know, where the NO2 is, where the other particle pollutants are in the city. And you just think, you know, any of us now could have this brainwave that could tap into this data stream. Could do good for the world. So after data, the third of the major trends that offers huge opportunities is knowing where you are through your device in the physical world in real time. It's connecting the digital world with the physical world in quite empowering ways. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of how already that future is here with geolocation. So you may use augmented reality apps. This is um, a browser that a Dutch company called Layar has developed, which uses the camera in your smartphone. And when you look through it, it projects onto the screen data, but visualized. So this is one called Plane Finder, which taps into a public database of where commercial aircraft are in the sky at any point. And that database tells you where they've been, how far away they are from you, where they're going, and so on. So you point this up, and that plane up there, that's come from Gibraltar. That's at 32,000 feet. And it's due to land at Heathrow in you know, 28 minutes. Um, I think it's really quite a fascinating way to visualize what's happening around you. The Daily Mail thought it was the terrorist's best friend. Well, I, you know, I think if you get terrorists with their smartphones up there and kind of missile launches, it, it's probably a giveaway. Um, but again, it's about creativity. It's about finding ways, like in the first film, to do things that are part of human behavior, that we actually enjoy doing, that make our lives easier. So if you're looking for a place to rent or buy, Rather than go onto an estate agent's website or go into the estate agent's office, why not point your camera around you in a street you like the look of and see, this is Amsterdam, each of those blue dots at the top is a different property. You can find the price. You can click to look at pictures. And my favorite one, I was in Berlin a couple of weeks ago. And if you go to where the Berlin Wall used to be, there's an app that shows you what it would have looked like through your camera phone. So again, it embeds you in history, it enhances that experience. So you're probably checking in here on geolocation apps like Foursquare. Your device says you are here. Somebody wants to give you a commercial offer to give you a benefit. They partnered with American Express. You get a good deal. There's all these shopping apps that know where you are. 1.7 miles away, there's this particular offer. Increasingly, they're going to tap into what you are actually interested in and what your friends are doing. Um, this is my favorite example of um, a geolocation app. Um, but this is about um, entirely different kinds of retail satisfaction and pleasure. This is um, an app called Bardu, which is run by a Russian guy who lives in London. And it's geolocation according to how far you are away from people whose pictures you like the look of. So you upload your picture, a couple of lines about yourself, and you can see, you know, I want to meet someone within 50 meters, 500 meters. Um, it's a hookup app, and it's free to use, and they've got 120 million members. It's not so big in the UK, but it's huge in Spain, Portugal, Brazil, France. And it's being valued in the billions because with 120 million members, lots of people are joining every day. And when you first join, you get at the top of the search results. But after a while, the next members do. So they allow you to pay a pound or a dollar or a euro temporarily to get up to the top of the search results. And people are paying. They're, paying, they're making hundreds of millions a year. And the founder, um, this Russian guy, Andre, was telling me, so a dating service, when they succeed, a customer goes away. With our service, if they succeed, they come back for more. So here's a word um, I'd like you to take away, solo mo. This is quite an important concept. It was coined by this man. He's a venture capitalist called John Dare from a company called Kleiner Perkins who invested early on into little 
risky startups like Amazon and Google. And Solo Mo is social and local and mobile. And he says that he's now only investing in businesses which offer all three of these opportunities. They tap into your social network, they know your location, they know where you are, and they work through the mobile devices because that is the untapped opportunity. That is the way to tap into people's spending. And it's already happening. So I'll give you some examples of how. So Facebook knows 800 million of your friends. Not yet friends, but deep friends. And it's using that connection, that social graph, to offer that knowledge to third parties. They're designing their businesses around the social graph. Um, this is an example. This is a recruitment service called Branch Out that taps into your Facebook friends and asks you to recommend other people, which is incredibly powerful, much more powerful than just cold advertising. Because you know, online your reputation counts for something, and if somebody recommends you. And just in a month, they grew from 10,000 users to a quarter of a million users. It's just exponentially growing. It's a threat to the existing recruitment world. So online retail that taps into the like button, into the social graph that Facebook has. So Giant Nerd is an outdoor equipment site. You can buy you know, ski gear and rafts and so on. Um, but it taps into you know, what your friends are buying and what they're interested in if you're logged into Facebook. You know, huge traffic increases, but more than that, people are spending much more money. Visitors are ending up as customers because there's this social connection. You know other people in real life who are using it. And then, of course, there's social gaming, which is a, a weird thing. This is a German company called Wooga. Free games, 36 million actively playing them on Facebook, but they're making pots of money because people are using their cash, their wallets, to buy weird things like virtual fuel to get them ahead in the games. So all kinds of transactions are going social. Um, and these guys, I've just done a piece about them for next month's issue. They, so Mark Zuckerberg's big push is what he calls social design. He says every business in every sector is going to have to rethink how it does business around the social graph. So already we're finding that gaming companies are there and media companies are starting to be there. But there isn't an industry sector, he says, that isn't going to be affected. You know, if you're selling stationery, if you're a transport company. Some examples of what's happening already. So there are services like Swipely, where they encourage you to give them access to all your credit cards, your PayPal account, your eBay account. And when you buy something, it will share it with the network, either to your private group or publicly. You may think, why do I want to do that? But quite a lot of people are because you know, we are what we do online now. And then there are these co-creation sites. This is one where collectively you come up with the best possible outfit or the best possible dinner party table setting and the crowd votes it up and you know there's quite a lot of encouragement to buy it. You're part of something that leads you to transact. Um, it, it solves some of life's greatest problems. So this is a service called Go Try It On. Um, you know that moment when you're shopping, you're in the changing room and you don't know whether to get the red top or the blue top but your other half isn't there so you can't ask. You take a picture, you upload it straight away to Go Try It On and the crowd tells you. They vote on it in real time. Um, but travel, I think, is going to be the next one. So if you think about you know, when you want to plan your holiday, it's no longer enough to go to the website or to look at the brochure. You want to know actually what's cool and what real experiences have people who you know, even at one remove, had. You know, should I take the chance at staying in this guest house or this hotel? I want to know somebody I can trust. TripAdvisor, somebody I can trust. So you're starting to get services like this one. 
I've been wanting to plan a trip to Beach Town since my friend Katie went and won't shut up about how great it is. But here's what happens when I research Beach Town on the travel sites. Hundreds of hotel links and reviews and I still know basically nothing about Beach Town because I don't know who to listen to. So here's what I do instead. I go to Trippy and I start a new trip. I say where I'm going and what I'm looking for and Trippy ties into my Facebook and other places to find my friends who can help. Oh look, Donnie went to school in Beach Town and Mikey just checked in there last week. And of course, I know how much Katie loves Beach Town. Hey, all right. Sweetie, what was the name of that beautiful resort we stayed at? Sea... Seashells. Seashells. Donnie says I should stay at Seashells, and some of my other friends seem to agree. So I click Add to Trip, and I can book it right from Trippy. Ooh, luxurious. I can't wait to stay there. Oh, and I know how you love shrimp tacos. You have to go to Sandy's. Um, yes, please. Oh, that is amazing. When I'm on my trip, I can use the Trippy app to capture it all in my album and share it with the people that made my trip great. Hey, all right. This trip is shaping up to be incredible. And if any of my friends are dreaming of a trip like this, it's real easy to copy it for themselves. Oh, and you can't leave without taking your picture at Cappy's Bluff. It's sort of a tradition. Okay, I'll do it. Cappy's Bluff. I knew I wanted to visit Beach Town. I got my friends to help me plan the trip, and I got to take them along for the ride. And what made it all possible? Trippy. It's the new way to travel. I do kind of worry that she's going to get sand in all her electronic devices. Um, so this is my friend Ryan. He lives in California, and he uses a lot of these sites. He uses um, one called Blippi, where he connected his credit cards and stuff. And I was looking at what he was doing. He was, you know, I've just bought some dental floss. I've just bought a T-shirt. And then I saw, I've just bought a Glock 23 gun. And there was a little conversation under this. Hey, that's really cool. Hey. And he was engaging in the conversation. I, I called him and I said, Ryan, can I just ask why you're doing this? Why are you telling people you're buying a gun? And he said, oh, well, I live so much of my life online. I just want to get respect from other people. I want to be cool. I want people to think what I'm buying is interesting and kind of boost my reputational value. Plus, I'm following other people I haven't met in real life on this network because I see them buying cool stuff and I want to know what else they're buying. If they're buying, you know, this car, what kind of vacation are they doing? So it's, it's a new kind of psychology. Um, but for brands, it's a no-brainer. So Volkswagen launched its Golf GTI last summer. Um, it didn't do a conventional advertising campaign. It did it on Facebook. And it realized that when you're buying a car, it's not just, you know, the value. It's what your friends and family think about it. So they created a way to customize the look of your GTI and then share it. Share my car on the social networks. Give me feedback on my spec. Um, and they had half a million people go through this process and they said it led to a huge rise in the number of test drives. And so you're getting Levi's when you're logged into Facebook, you go to their website. It knows what your friends have been looking at and buying and liking and it gives you your personal store. This is Jeremiah's store with all the, pro the particular products that his friends recommend. Um, so the psychology thing, we're kind of weird. So this is a virtual nightclub on a virtual asteroid that lives in a game called Project Ento Entropia that last year sold for 635,000 real dollars. Because a lot of people invest time to build status in the game, but it has real real estate value. Um, this is a free smartphone game Mini Tycoon Casino. Shervin Pesheva, who owned the company, told me that one woman had just spent $40,000 personalizing her little corner of the casino. To her, that was an important aspect of her online identity. A lot of her friends played there. And then, of course, we're all competing for our reputational value. So there are services now like Clout, which give you a score out of 100. And they break down, you know, what kind of person are you, a follower or an influencer? So I, I need to work on mine. It's 54, which isn't bad. But then it, you know, it calculates who's retweeting you and how important they are. But it's starting to have an effect in the physical world. So this is a fashion show party in New York a couple of weeks ago where they demanded a clout score of 40 to get in. And I've heard of marketing organizations that now won't interview staff unless they've got a clout score of 50. Hi. Um, so the, the weird thing about what we're doing online 
and how it wouldn't, wouldn't really relate to real world behavior. You just got to sometimes stop and think what our changing expectations are. So many of you are on Facebook, but just think about what you do on Facebook and if it were real life. Guys, you um, can, I, can I be your friend? Um, can, I, can I write on your wall? No. Will you be my friend? Hmm? But I, I write on all my friends' walls. I think I'd have to know you before I was your friend. All my friends have got like 180 friends. I've only got two. Yeah? Would it help if maybe like you looked at my photos? No, that one's uh, with two like really pretty girls. Like, you know, that's my ex, you know, I was in a relationship with her, but you know, I've changed my status now. Okay. Yeah. What's your relationship status? Um, single. Oh, good. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I like your jacket. Thank you. I like your sunglasses. Do you like that? Yeah. Do you want to comment on it? I like your Ray-Bans. Could I poke you? Ooh. Poke? Ooh. Poke? Ooh. No? Uh, no. What, poke? Ooh. What, you want to poke? Can I poke you? Yeah, you can poke me if you want. Yeah. I mean, how am I... No, no, dude, dude, seriously, just be my friend. If I just show you these pictures in this photo album... What's your name on Twitter? Mark de Libre. Uh, so you use Twitter? Yeah. I'm going to follow you. OK. Cool, cool. Well, I'm going to follow you. So you right. guess okay. cool. Okay. Right. Thanks a lot. Nice one. Um, that's actually um, a promo for an English national opera. Opera um, that's aiming at making you think about what we are giving away in the social world. Um, but the psychology, again, we've learned now that if you can create game culture around all sorts of activities, people will perform and they'll compete. And it's extending to things like this is the Prius dashboard. So it's trying to encourage you to save fuel. And it does it competitively. So you can compete to see who in your region is most fuel efficient. There's a company that's coming fr from the US to the UK now called Opower that's designing electricity and gas bills that are behaviorally, behaviorally um, targeting people who use too much fuel. So they don't just tell you how much gas you've used. They tell you how much the neighbors use, but also how much the most efficient neighbors use. And they say that people that get this kind of bill use 4% less fuel straight away. And of course, the, 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 this is something I run with. This is RunKeeper. It's an app. But they encourage you to share online with your community. And it's kind of peer pressure. If you don't go for a run that weekend, people want to know. And they'll comment, and so on. Um, so one of the other things that is pretty unstoppable now is the peer-to-peer -peer trend. The institution really has to fight to exist because the crowd can do all sorts of stuff. In Kenya, they're bypassing the banking system. Not many ATMs in rural Kenya. So Vodafone, with help from the British government, set up this service that you can use your cell phone to transfer money to somebody else called M-Pesa. It's got huge. It's about four years old. And now about 25 to 30% of all money transferred in Kenya goes through this system. There's now peer-to-peer -peer foreign currency. Why should the bank take a nice commission? This service, transfer-wise, somebody's got euros, you've got pounds. It will charge a pound to make that connection at the bank rate. Peer-to-peer -peer lending. British company Zopa. It's just the start of the growth of this. If the banks are not safe, what is? You know, car hire. Why are Avis and Hertz safe when we've all got cars that we're not using most of the time at home? I'm going to show you. This is money transfer as well. I'm going to show you the car one. Where's the car one? I'll get to the car one in a second. Let me tell you about this one. We can all be designers now. The crowd can tell you if your product is good and also if they will invest in it. A couple of guys decided they want to create a watch based on the iPod Nano screen, but with a lovely little strap, and they thought it would take $15,000. 13,500 people thought it was cool and pledged a million dollars. So it's now a business. Kickstarter, the website, 
where you can pitch any creative endeavor. You want to write a book, make a film. The crowd can build a car. There's an American company called Local Motors where the crowd boats on and suggests designs for a car. This is a rally car. And they actually made it happen. For $50,000, you can now be the owner of this. They'll even let you work with them to build it. And you know, universities, too, can be crowdsourced. This is a guy called Sal Khan who started making educational short videos for his niece, put them online. Lots of people showed interest. He's now got something like 7,200, and it's called the Khan Academy. And anybody can go there for a university-level education. Go and try it. Um, this is the car thing. Volume? He owns a car. He likes owning a car. But it is expensive, and it often just sits there doing nothing. This morning, Dave put his car on Whipcar. It was completely free, and it only took him five minutes. This is Kate. Kate is lovely. She doesn't own a car, but she does need to use one every now and then. If Kate visits Whipcar.com, she can find lots of cars that are available to rent within a five-minute walk. Whip car owners set their own prices, and Kate can rent a car for as little as an hour. For Kate, Whip car is the most convenient and affordable way of renting a car. Once a booking is agreed, Whip car's partners automatically insure Dave's car for this rental, so he doesn't need to worry about his no claims bonus. To pick up the car, Kate simply brings her booking number and her driving license to the agreed location. So, Kate uses Whipcar to rent a car that is close, convenient and affordable, and Dave uses Whipcar to make money whenever he's not using So basically, any of us have to think, what is our business adding in terms of value to the internet? Because the internet can pretty much do most things. So this is a lovely service. This is um, called Waze, an Israeli company. If you join it, it tracks your cell phone movement, so when you're in traffic, you contribute to a real-time map showing where the police radar traps are, where the traffic is, and of course, you get the benefits of that. So one of the big trends, we talked about digital, is what's happening in the physical manufacturing world. Um, so what happened to zeros and ones is now happening to physical products. And I'm, I'm talking about additive manufacturing or 3D printing. The fact that you can now design on screen things that can be made tiny layer by layer in all sorts of materials. Some examples, um, British company called Within Technologies that designs engine parts, high grade steel. Design it for maximum strength, but as light as possible. It's hollow in most places. Um, same company designs these titanium medical implants. These are spinal implants. Again, lots of holes in them to make them light and also so your bone can fuse with them. You can't make things like this easily in standard manufacture, but printing layer by layer, you can. We had in our office last week a copied Stradivarius. They 3D scanned a Strad. This German company called EOS printed it layer by layer, like a tenth or less of a millimeter. We had somebody playing it and it sounded pretty good. So you can print chains. I'm going to show you a couple of things already being made get a close-up. This is a piece of chain mail printed in one go. It wasn't printed in little bits and then interlinked. It was all printed in one go. And then this, this is plastic. It's a ball within a ball within a ball within a ball that, again, was printed in one of these 3D printing machines all at once. So we can all be manufacturers. A nylon bicycle. It's a UAV that was designed in a week and made by some students in Southampton. This is an artwork. Artist Eyal Gavir decided, I like explosions and tsunamis. I want to design them on screen and get them printed out layer by layer. This is printed. Um, clothes that fit you perfectly, because they respond to your 3D scan. Um, and it changes all sorts of rules. So copyright, what happens? Can you copy physical product design like you can copy music? Well, yes. So this film, Super 8, had a cube in it. And somebody went on to Shapeways, a community of enthusiasts of 3D printing, and made his version of this. And he got a cease and desist letter 
from Paramount, the film studio, but of course that's not going to work, is it? They're also starting to make body parts using your cells, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so what does it mean for privacy, all this data, knowing where we are? Ordering a pizza in the future is going to be a lot like this. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. Is this Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could say $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh, but I see you checked out the budget beach bum at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the Sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Got to watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Um, I should say that's not an advert for a pizza company. That's the American Council for Civil Liberties warning you. But I think you kind of get the picture. Privacy, as we understand it, is over. We did a cover story in Wired a few months ago where we picked a bunch of our subscribers at random and went into the public internet and custom printed covers based on stuff we'd found out about them. You know, arguments that they'd had with their boyfriends on the social networks, videos their kids had posted on YouTube. And many of them were shocked about what they put out there. Um, so the last of my Big Ten trends is the way we interface with technology is going to change. It's going to become much more natural. Technology will disappear. Um, for instance, a Swedish company called Toby that develops eye tracking software and cameras um, they used to use it to optimize an advert. They've now embedded it inside laptops so that you can navigate the laptop without using your hand. No mouse, no keyboard. I've tried it. It's slightly disconcerting, but you drag files and you open folders by looking at them. Um, you've probably played Connect, where the 3D depth sensing camera tracks you across the room. There's going to be lots more examples, I think, of um, machinery that understands you as the person. Um, but I'm an optimist. and. All this data and these devices that track your sleep. This is a device. You wear a band around your head. The Zeo knows what stage of sleep you're at and wakes you up at the optimum level. You get your REM, and it gives you a graph of your sleep patterns. Um, companies like Wythings in Paris are developing these products. This is scales that connect to the internet so you can track your weight. Um, they just launched this a few months ago, which I love. It's a blood pressure monitor that you connect to your phone or your iPad, and it does medical standard diastolic, systolic blood pressure readings. Um, and I've been using this. I should do it on some of the other speakers, actually, as they're on stage. But you can send the data in real time to your physician, so you don't have to go to the hospital to a visit. Um, there's going to be a lot more of this. And you know, with all these things happening, it's just at the beginning of the disruption. Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy writer, said quite wisely, um, that any technology that was there by the time you were 15, it's part of the order of nature. It's how it's always been. Anything invented between your 15th and 35th birthday, it's quite exciting, and you, know, you might get a career benefit from it. But anything invented after your 35 is against nature and should be prohibited. So I will leave you with the thought that, um, I'm not going to guess how old any of you are, but talk to a few 15-year-olds, because you know, they're studying probably for jobs that haven't yet been invented. So what are their expectations? 
And you know, since I've been standing here, this is what's been happening on the social media. It ain't slowing down. So thank you very much. And I don't know if the bus wants a quick question or two, or do you want? OK. And I think there are some microphones running around. So if anybody wants to raise any questions, I think we have hands for whoever wants to ask a question. OK, there's a microphone heading to the second row, please. I'm going to check, check your blood pressure after this. OK, yeah, thank you. Hello there. Just wanted to know, I have a beauty salon, so it's a very physical world I live in. How would this world benefit my, my business? Well, people go to a beauty salon to enhance their public reputation, to look good. So I suppose if there were certain treatments that your friends were doing that were getting them quite good comments in the pub, you'd want to know about it. So it's just an example of a business that if you can let the customer connect with others and find a useful service to add, then why won't they come to you for more treatments, for more expensive treatments? And also, you know, you can do beautiful visualizations of what they will look like afterwards and send it out on the internet so they can share with their friends. It's imagination. The technology's there. Do I see a hand? You're all hungry for lunch, aren't you? Let's wrap up. Thank you very much.